Hello everybody, welcome to the IQ and hot focus on the Hungarian music scene. Moon with four great professionals, each of them from a distinct sector of the music business. We are going to introduce you to the Hungarian music scene. Um, I'm happy to welcome here Mimi Körös, um, a singer-songwriter known as Sayanoe, Sonny Ferenczi, who's a front woman and the manager of a surf punk band called Schemers. Matti Horvat, a promoter and also the founder of New Beat and agent at 3S Music uh, Management. And also Zoltán Jakab, agent at Doomstar Bookings. And I'm Lucia Nagyove from HOT, the Hungarian Music Export Office. Guys, it's great to have you here. Um, if you could tell us some more about yourselves, that would be great. Mimi and Sonny, please start and then we can move on to the guys. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Mimi Koros, and I am a singer-songwriter. I run a solo project uh, under the name Sian Away and have been a part of the Hungarian music industry for only under two years. Uh, so I don't have that much experience, definitely the least experience out of everyone here. But uh, I mean, under the circumstances, I've tried to do as much as I can, so it's been really nice. And I also stream on Twitch several times a week. I've done that for the past two years, so that's those. Those are my two main territories currently. Great, thank you, Sony. If you can introduce yourself, hi guys. Sure, uh, my name is Sony. I'm a singer of uh, Schemers. We are making surf punk kind of music and uh, we are also from uh, Budapest. Uh, the band exists I think for like six or seven years. Um, the last year it was like super hard on us because we're a small band here in Budapest and we were just uh, being recognized by uh, international audience when uh, coronavirus hit and uh, unfortunately our 2020 plans were um, very much destroyed. So we had to like recreate everything that we were planning and uh, now we're here. Mate, please introduce yourself. Hello everybody, my name is Mate Horvat and uh, as Lucia said, I'm a promoter mainly in Budapest. Based in Budapest, I'm working with a couple of venues doing uh, shows. Um, mostly in Dürer Kerten Budapest Park, which is an opener venue. Also booking some festivals. And uh, when I'm wearing my other hat, I'm working as an agent at 3S Music Management, which is a Dutch company. And I'm the head of the office in Budapest of this mentioned company. I'm also hosting um, two professional events. One is a uh, event production conference and the other is uh, Outbreakers Lab, which is an artist mentoring camp. And regarding how it was in the last year, uh, when I was, uh, well, I'm involved in postponing shows, which I'm promoting, and then I'm starting to postpone shows, which I'm booking <laughs> as an agent. So it's a full of postponement year. And also, um, well, the, the venue in-house promoter called Dürer Kert is, well, it had to leave its original location where it was resident for 12 years. And now we are moving to a new location, which I can't disclose yet, but we are in a pretty good progress. And uh, as you can imagine, losing uh, more than a half years of income before such a project, it's a really heavy, heavy burden now, but well, we are determined and it will happen. Sorry, can you Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Zoltan Jakob. I'm a former promoter in Budapest. I used to um, actually co-work with Mate um, back in the day. Um, but now I'm primarily an agent with uh, Dutch company Doomstar Bookings. I represent about 15 to 20 great international artists Europe-wide and i got a small merchandise company with a close friend and we are basically printing uh pretty shirts for ugly metal bands and i'm also a freelance tour manager as as far as 2020 
I do not think I got anything new to report other than my esteemed colleagues have been reporting. Um, I am big into the postponement game. I am trying to break the world record to book the same tour as many times as possible before it finally can happen. Um, it's been obviously tough. I, I have spent a lot of time on the road as a tour manager about 10, nine, 10 weeks out of uh, three months before COVID hit. So my last European tour finished about 11 months ago. So that obviously takes its toll on someone who's uh, used to be ever moving, but it at least gives me as much focus as I can have to do my other things. Thank you. Um, but you're also the manager of The Devil's Trade, whose concert you maybe saw on Tuesday at our um, hosts and IQ showcase. Um, you made me look bad, and I totally forgot. <laughs> but yeah, I... <laughs> you can still watch it. It's still online. <laughs> yes, so... Um, yeah, so... You, I think David had an international tour before the uh, the outbreak of the virus. Um, how did you cope um, with um, with changing your plans and um, um, what alternatives did you find for his um, his um, tour and uh, and what what exactly and what plans did you make in terms of export and but you can mention anything else as well. Well, um, he is actually it's his tour that I'm breaking the world record on because um, his his um, we had a um, a brand new record deal set with um, French underground label Season of Mist, and we hope the record is going to be out by March April when the tour was supposed to happen as we build it around uh, Roadburn Festival. Um, Obviously, when, when restrictions hit in March, I, I had to act really fast. So first, in my naive hopes that we're going to have a nice fall, I rebooked the tour for fall 2020. That took me like two days, and I was super happy. And then as soon as, uh, soon as news started to break that it's going to take a lot longer, I had to move that tour into April 2021. Obviously, we are moving this tour again. Um, because there is no way that it's going to happen in April 2021, and and we're probably trying to add more dates. Obviously, what's um, what's an upside with David, the Devil's Trade's work, is that he's a singer-songwriter primarily, but rooted in metal. So um, we always try to go a little different path. So this tour that we had to postpone, it was with another amazing singer-songwriter called Darker and a Swedish folk act called Forndom. But then we had a metal tour planned for November 2021, which theoretically could have happened, but the headliner of that tour, another band that I represent, had another tour postponed. So we, we're we going to have to postpone that tour first, cancel this tour, and remove it. So it's it's about constant moving and constant postponing. Um, the, the thing with David is that you really have to see him live. You really have to feel that you cannot feel the same things looking at this person performing amazing art and, and, and filling rooms with his massive voice. And, and it's so much harder that you, you, you print that into plastic, you press that onto plastic, and it's amazing to hear you know, his music on, on, on an LP or CD or, or digitally. But he his main forte is playing live. I mean, just before COVID hit, he he did four shows at Eurosonic, and and one of it was incredibly packed, and and we had the best feedback ever to that, and and we said like export things make sense finally because we managed to get David out to the right people. Obviously. Um, it's it's not necessarily as as much of an online thing, but we're gonna have to go digital in in some ways, and that is something we're collaborating. Um, we launched his official merch store just um, two months ago, and we had very good feedback to that. Obviously, wh whatever income was planned has to be replaced somehow, and that's that's only 
um, right now doing merchandise sales. I mean, we were really lucky because we got to have an amazingly packed open air record release show late August and the record just arrived on time. So obviously that did help, but that is something that we need to do. We need to build. We are doing gazillion streams. Um, we just had the IQ magazine stream. We we had our own branded stream for him through Empire Merch as uh, to help launch his store. Um, he did an Instagram show for Roadburn, which was really amazing. But or him as an artist who creates intimate settings live, it's impossible to sit in front of a camera. I, as a manager and a booking agent, have a much better time looking at him play out of his living room and reading comments that people are super amazed by it but it's just so much different you know for him and and obviously this is an avenue that we keep having to explore and and on the other hand we are entering into a collaboration into something awesome with another artist but i have yet not allowed to speak about that for now but it's going to be amazing. There's a new single coming mid-February. And, and it's for now, it's a digital-only release via Season of Mist. But it's going to be something very, I think, groundbreaking for him because it's merging a completely different music world with his more traditional folk-like, heavy, intense music. And we're really looking forward to it. And then we're hoping domestic touring and domestic at least gigging opportunities are going to open up in the foreseeable future and then as soon as as soon as the world reopens i think it's going to be non-stop touring because that is that is his strong forte that is where he's good at yeah, thank you and i'm really relieved that he's still motivated and i must admit that i'm looking forward to his live uh, concerts very much um, thank you. Um, Matty, um, you have uh, deep insight uh, into the club scene of Hungary. How would you uh, characterize it? What do you think about it? Maybe you can mention um, the pre-COVID status of it as well. Um, you know, on the, on the, when you mean club scene, I'm looking after 99% touring artists, so I'm not really working in the domestic uh, market that way but we are having way too few clubs in budapest i mean live music venues to be correct and in the countryside it's almost there's almost nothing i mean there are some very good venues in the countryside but international touring is just not really happening it's it's another very long panel to discuss why is that i think it's a cultural and financial rooted problem um we were looking really good so i'm i'm constantly talking with friends and colleagues that like like last year this time we were thinking that the best year is just this will be the best time like 2020 will be the, the best touring shows the biggest sales great income whatever and then obviously in January, it was already something I was, you know, like reading the news that something is happening and something is coming. But at, at really at this point, we were not really thinking it can be this serious or this, this uh, crazy. Uh, what I can say is that almost all the shows I'm promoting, let's say almost all the shows I was promoting a year ago, they were postponed. So most of the artists, the agencies, everybody is basically trying to hold on to, to the money and to something what's firm, at least the belief that there will be something happening and there will be shows. Obviously, there are some very unlucky situations, like I have shows which were postponed thrice already, and I'm still not sure if it will be, you know, if it will be okay at the end but but uh, the, the crowd was very patient the artists are very patient so what we can see is that all tours and as, as Oli said that you know like everybody's trying to copy paste what's happening so i can say 80 percent of the tours will happen at some point maybe some shows are falling out some other shows getting in and obviously there were some cancellations on the on the bigger level like on the arena level it's i can say it's almost the same and in Budapest, 
there we have like 12 shows on sale we had 12 shows on sale for 2020 and most of them are still on there were very very few pure cancellations and you know the sad thing is that we already know that a bunch of those events like may or june that there's a good chance that those can't happen and it's not just a question of local regulations we are also looking at the fact that simply travel won't be possible or not in the way as we you know as a touring artist would expect it so it will be it will be another i assume another six months uh and we really hope that that in in like and as as again as always said that there is a very good chance that we will have domestic artists playing shows for maybe a thousand people outdoors um in may but as i said i don't see any any foreign artists entering the schengen zone for europe or vice versa so like the the artists we are representing for the united states uh there is i mean we just don't and what i really hope that in 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 the, in the fall we, we might have a you know like a restart uh, for the club shows and then this the series of club events and the indoor events thanks thanks and um now let's move to the artists <laughs> Sonny, um, you are a front woman and a singer of an uh, emerging Hungarian band um, and we can say that live performance is your strength. Uh, how did you manage to overcome this period and do you think that the identity of the band has changed in any ways during this period and in what way, how? <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> that's what I wanted. Mm, it's so funny because uh, we all know each other from like different uh, sides of the music industry and uh, I can totally relate to whatever Zoli or Mate said because I actually saw David live like back 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 in the days when it was like his first few shows in like very small venues and like you could like already see that this is really something that you have to experience live because it's just like sucks you in and and i can remember basically the whole thing from minute to minute it was so impressive and i remember every time when i saw mate posting about some a uh, gig that he booked in the uh, budapest park and i was just like oh my god it's going to happen i can't believe and they were like insane amount of very cool bands coming to us finally in 2020 or at least that's what we thought and i was just so looking forward to seeing them because not just because i like the kind of music but first time in like a very long time i felt like i can finally get inspiration live from bands that i actually really really love as a musician so i was looking forward to that and i still look forward to that and i'm very patient and i hope that they're actually going to make it here at some point in life uh for us it was um, very interesting because the last day before the lockdown we actually went for um for like this uh, gig recording basically we were playing four or five songs uh, on the countryside of uh, hungary it was a special thing um not too many people uh, there so it wasn't something um, where it was an actual concert but just a recording and um, and we came back and from that point basically we haven't met for two months and i remember that i went through all sorts of uh, feelings from oh my god like does that mean that this is the end of our band because we can't see the end of this whole thing and it's just so overwhelming out of nowhere we we can't go anywhere and we can't do anything on the other hand when i got through this with obviously the help of my bandmates we just started to reinvent ourselves basically like how can we exist in this thing and i remember that once i was literally just curious about how other people are doing it and i just wrote out this post on facebook like like, hey guys, like the others who are playing music, like, do you guys um, rehearse? Like, do you go some, and I, I got this like insane uh, rage from one or two people like, oh, you are the one who guys are putting us in danger because you're going out and like, blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, it was so um, uh, confusing that as many people as different views on this whole situation in the virus, so like at that two months, we were basically just trying to put together what we want from the band. And um, 
actually we went to uh, outbreakers lab uh, in the summer and uh, that also helped us a lot actually to to see who we are because for three days we were basically only talking about bands and music and, and who we are and what we are and it helped us to basically put us on the track and and decide on things that before we didn't really have time so if for something that period was great for us to to rethink the things that we had to confess to ourselves like for example as Matthew mentioned there is no really reason for us to go on the countryside of Hungary because we go there and there are like 10 people who come to our gig because as much as we would like to talk to them our music is really this Budapest thing and I'm very happy when people from the countryside are coming to see us and it's it's great but as a musician it can mentally also be challenging when when I go somewhere to play and actually there's it literally happened that one person was there and like you know like you just get this feeling that um, am i good enough because i as a musician will never get the same advertising opportunity or advertisement as like the hungarian pop bands because our music is english and it is very much for a smaller percentage of people so we basically decided on not to go on the countryside unless you know it's it's a good money that we can invest into our band or it is really something where we feel like that it is a good opportunity for us so we're just not going to take on all the opportunities that we're having and basically these were little things that actually very much changed our views on how we see ourselves and i also feel like that it gave us a little bit of um calmness in a sense that right now this is what we have and if we want to live in the present then <laughs> this is a good opportunity we don't we don't have to push ourselves and or you know do things that that are that would be too much for us and um and yeah it, it was uh, it was challenging but also we we learned a lot and there's one more good thing that came out of it is that we constantly were releasing music as new music, but we actually played them in gigs all the time because we didn't have new music. It's just, it wasn't recorded. So when we did something new, we always put it into the track list whenever we went to play a live show. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, when we released a new album or something, it were the same songs. But now we actually have three or four new songs that nobody heard yet. And it's such a great feeling that finally we can release something that people never heard. So it is also a great thing. <laughs> it's definitely easier for solo acts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was a great point, actually, the difference between country and Budapest. And I think it's, uh, it actually touches the, um, um, it's, it's a general problem uh, for most of the artists based in Budapest. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, fest showcase festivals and and especially online showcase festivals. I think you played at one, at least at one. Um, do you think that showcase festivals are uh, efficient uh, in terms of uh, export strategies, or do you think that that online showcase festivals can also do <laughs> the same thing? um when we had the chance to play live it was a uh, bush budapest showcase hub and i remember that uh, what helped a lot for us is that actually we could meet the people you know face to face who then we could invite to our gig and tell them that hey we're playing here and there so um in the point of view of uh, making connections and networking that was a very very great opportunity and also honestly uh, I think that's my top three gigs what we had uh, in uh, Budapest Showcase Hub because the team was just so amazing and like the venue was so uh, fitting for our music that that everything just worked out very well and I remember that after that we had a lot of um, great feedback from from here and there uh, Germany uh, places like that where they said like you know finally uh, girl power uh, woman fronted uh, surf punk band and, and you know we just uh, we would love to hear more about you rah 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 and uh, at the end of the day <laughs> it just turned out to be covid so like everyone was uh, uh, more interested in in uh, in other stuff than uh, 
done an interview with us. And on the other hand, we were invited to spring break, which never happened. And we were so devastated about that because we really felt like, as I said before, that 2020 is really going to be our year because finally we we came to that side of, of the foreign uh, uh, music industry. And it was such a great feeling because actually we are already signed in a Los Angeles based sync company. So our music is actually out there already, but it is very different than playing live shows because obviously the sync agency is not really into you playing live shows. They are never going to get you out to Los Angeles. They are not trying to tour you or whatever. So like these opportunities were like, very big for us and uh, it didn't happen and unfortunately we didn't have the opportunity to play like uh, the devil's trade um, like these live uh, streams um, spring break happened in a way that they wanted us to send them uh, a little video of us playing <laughs> but that was actually the time when two of our uh, bandmates uh, actually got COVID. So like we couldn't come together and we couldn't um, uh, play as, a, as, as all of us. And on the other hand, it was a very, it would have been very expensive to put together this, this very good recording with a, with a great um, uh, visual too. So we just did like this, uh, this short uh, four or five song uh, acoustic version of our songs, which gives back nothing from, you know, our, power and presence uh, on the stage. So I really, really look forward to play more showcase festivals in the future. And I really hope that they're going to invite us. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mimi, you've got a strong presence uh, and uh, ever growing presence uh, uh, online and a growing follower base on uh, Twitch mainly. Um, do you find it right. difficult to to come up with something new every day and to uh, <laughs> get fans engaged and followers um, interacting with each other? How do you uh, think about this? Oh man, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it happens on its own. <laughs> I don't have a lot to do with it. I'm just there. <laughs> no, <That's> um, <laughs> but, no. In all seriousness, though, uh, it's. It, I would say it's it's challenging, yeah, to always come up with new stuff, but it's it's an exciting kind of challenge because I'm kind of also, you know, a part of it unfolding. And so it's almost as if I was I was a third party experiencing something that's happening to me and I'm kind of I'm in control. But since uh, on Twitch, everything happens along with, you know, everyone's a part of uh the content that is current, um, it's exciting because I'm yeah experiencing, but a part of it and controlling it at the same time. Uh, yeah, so it's 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 I guess just a matter of being receptive to to what uh, what my what my viewers are into, what they're what they're interested in. We're always kind of just experimenting with with things. So it, you know, it's it's a balance between doing what I what I enjoy and, you know, playing songs that I like and, and bringing up topics that are relevant to me or important to me, but also adapting, being adaptive, uh, you know, to, to what those that are present uh, are interested in. So we're kind of always, yeah, experimenting together. And, you know, this last year has been, ha has been very interesting, uh, in more that more ways than one i am definitely not not someone that can complain i've been extremely extremely fortunate um in a sense that i was able to do what what i what i do i've i've been able to continue doing music and and my plan for 2020 was was to mainly focus on uh my debut album so my plan was kind of initially to to draw back and 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 to focus on songwriting, and I was able to uh, to have that have that be possible. Um, obviously, obviously, it sucked to have all our shows canceled, and you know there were some really cool trips uh, abroad. But you know, soon it became evident that globally people started suffering more and more, and you know, losing their jobs, losing their loved ones, and and those were so much worse than what. I was losing out on so it just made me I guess feel very 
grateful for what I do have and being on a platform like Twitch where I get to have a community. I'm on Discord right now and my viewers are watch, <laughs> watching there and commenting uh, <laughs> real time. It's 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 been uh, almost, no, not almost, actually very therapeutic to go through this whole experience together. And, uh, you know, it is, it is something that we get to share, share our stories, share our experiences, and I guess not feel alone. Uh, which is, I, I guess, one of the most one of the most uh, important tools that we have currently uh, is to be able to express ourselves, use the online platforms to express ourselves, but also to connect and find rev relevance in what we do and and find those common grounds from which we can grow together and create something. Uh, you know, so so I guess to. What was the initial question? Uh, it was about I've gotten, I've gotten lost, but, but yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of you know growing and and coming up with new content, uh, yeah, I, I I have ideas, but they always transform. Uh, they was, always it, transform. was it an asset for you? What you could rely on during the um, the first phase of of COVID? Uh, I mean, the only mm, yeah. Abs absolutely. Um, I guess. It it was it was a very it was very lucky. Um, I was very lucky to have um, I guess discovered Twitch before COVID, and so I went into it uh, completely intentionally. Um, I wanted this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to um, you know grow my online audience in order to be able to expand expand to a lot more regions uh than than you know re it is possible regionally because i know that if if you do something that might not be very popular or very lucky regionally you know as as experimental as it can get you are able to do whatever alternative small genre of music that you want to if you have an online online platform where you can find those individuals scattered in the world so you can you know have the confidence to do whatever you want because you will find an audience that is interested in that and from there once you have that basis you can grow together and you know just yeah uh, i always love to see your optimism it's, it's it's really great um i have a more general question for all of you guys mm -hmm. Um, you you all see the music industry and the Hungarian music scene from a different perspective and different angles. Um, what do you think about the post-Soviet heritage and maybe just the regional traditions in general? Do you think it influences um, um, the identity of our music and do you think it adds something to it? Um, it does it form the identity and can or should we build on it? It's just, I don't know, Sony, if you could add anything to this. Sure. Um, actually, we were uh, talking about this um, when you sent over the questions. And uh, and I really do believe that our music is so highly rooted uh, in in American um, uh, scenes that, that, that I couldn't really say that we pick up anything from that. Like since I was very little, I was literally only listening to music that was coming from America, coming from England, and and it influenced me so hard that that right now that's my main goal to do that sort of music. So I think in our music you can't really find um, these post-Soviet um, um, signs. But do you think it's getting um, more and more um, often that uh, bands go back to these roots? I, I don't really mean only Soviet, uh, post-Soviet things, but also, um, I don't know, um, these unique uh, traditional uh, folk uh, things and stuff. Do we use it and are we good at it? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I do believe that actually uh, we have... Um, uh, a very good uh, band called Key Man. And uh, Key Man is mainly focusing on uh, this instrumental 
uh, American music. And if you listen to it, you just feel like you went back to the 60s and just like surfing in, in California. And, you know, these guys basically saw uh, the sea uh, in America maybe once. <laughs> and like they just sound so authentic that uh, it's insane because uh, they are just like feeding off of, of this music. And actually, uh, we are also uh, planning to release um, that's actually a secret, but I'm just going to tell you now. <laughs> a few songs that uh, that are folk songs. Uh, the the base of it are are folk songs, and uh, and I'm very interested what people are going to say because, of course, we could choose a few more uh, genres that we feel close to our hearts. But actually, what we do this surf punk kind of music and the folk. I don't think that's too far from each other. And also these are two things that we can really relate to. So, you know, from the points of uh, topic and to the to the to the instruments that we are using are all going back to these times and and uh, picking up uh, inspiration from that times. Thank you. It's it's a really interesting, yeah. Um, but when talking about the characteristics of uh, the Hungarian music, uh, um, I, I think we also need to mention that um, the Hungarian music scene and uh, the industry faces uh, many problems uh, uh, day by day. Uh, we, we can, I think, <laughs> talk about this a lot, but, but I wanted to talk to you and ask you about today uh, was a more current issue um, and the so-called um, warehouse concerts. Um, it's basically a kind of response of the government uh, uh, to the musicians calling for help and uh, who were waiting for something uh, similar to uh, the, the measures which were introduced by uh, mostly Western European countries, um, um, different kind of um, um, help uh, packages to uh, the musicians hit by the virus. So the Hungarian government introduced um, a subsidy scheme, we could say, uh, for and, and offered money for a large number of bands and uh, and musicians um, uh, in exchange for concert videos um, produced in a, an empty warehouse without public. Um, we know that it ha it ha faced a lot of criticism from the side of professionals and musicians as well. If uh, um, can you please um, um, sum up what criticism was about and uh, and uh, what uh, the main setbacks of this uh, program was? Uh, you know, the, just I just wanted to say a, a, like some extra to the post-Soviet heritage thing. Oh, it's pretty sorry. funny that you brought this you brought this up right after the, the post-Soviet method <laughs> because I yeah. was on a Ferris skill for a long time because I it was like years ago and I had this this picture in my mind that the post-Soviet block is like this. But I think uh, it's it's really changing, and at this point, I can only say that the the only common line between all post-Soviet countries, and we are talking about a pretty huge territory with a lot of people living in it, very different uh, living standards, is that the only common part at this point is corruption. I think because things went very far from each other, so we can say that in the '90s the German pop music was having a very strong effect on on the on the central eastern european countries but now it's not really in effect because poisoned by viva television's uh, heritage in the same time in poland uh, you don't i mean poland has a much more stronger this anglo-saxon-ish uh, touch at, at least that's what i see but i just really want to point out and and as you get to the pretty funny you i mean the corruption and this whole trend is th this is what I really feel the last last bastion of, of the post-Soviet era in in I mean in this country and in this region. But Zoli wanted to. Oh yeah, I'm I'm actually you took the word out of my mouth. I I it's it's funny you bring up the warehouse shows after the post-Soviet era because if if we look at it, it music wasn't intentional. <laughs> right. Well, it you know it's 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 really interesting. Um, 
on on one hand, I I see a lot of post-Sovietism in a lot of great Ukrainian and Russian and acts, even from Belarus, that got that really edgy Slavic touch. You know what I mean? And 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 even the metal scene has so many bands like that. But um, um as far as post-Sovietism goes, um, I I think it's about time that we get rid of it. It's about time that we get rid of the ways of the old and look at ways of new. And, and that's why it's really exciting to sit here with Mimi and Sony, because they they are um, luckily significantly younger than I am, probably, because I'm uh, I'm I'm uh, in my 40s now. So I, I, I still was raised up in the in the underground club and metal scene of, of the mid 90s. And that was so different, you know, and, and until we cannot get rid of ways of the old, then it's really hard to change. And that ties into what I got to say about the warehouse shows. Um, obviously, to to set up big artists in a warehouse makes sense because you need big clubs to host artists that um, pack out Hungarian festivals. and. But in, in the long run, ways of the old are still there because, you know, you don't really know who's getting selected. Why? I mean, obviously, you know, obviously there is an explanation. But what about the rest? What about what about I'm 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 road crew. So I, I tour four or five months a week. So all these people are my family that I tour with, you know, the light engineer, the sound guy, everything. Um, the bartenders, the uh, the venue staff, cleaning people, everything. I, I understand that you have to lift up 100 bands, 150 bands. You have to lift them up. You have to give them an opportunity. But what about the people that make the show happen? And it's not only the people of these. It's not only the back staff of these, of these artists that make the show happen. It's, it's tens of thousands of people that have families to feed and everything and and while the warehouse concept is understandable in some standard because i know you got a big uh you got a big band you cannot put it out duracart you cannot put them in a38 maybe you cannot even put them in aquarium um all the opener places are closed during the summer uh during the winter times so you got to do something but but what about the venues what about the venue staff that is out of work what about what about the people needing to feed their kids and they have a special skill set skill set at their disposal and that skill set is live music and and i and i know it's very easy to say to someone who's been a great sound engineer and tell this great sound engineer go work in some warehouse and and deliver milk or whatever so i i think it on on one hand it's okay to do that but there's like a whole segment of musicians and a whole segment of artists that are nowhere near being able to be helped out and their crew and their people. But these are the very artists that are not post-Soviet anymore because these are the very artists that are maybe, these are artists that got something to say to people that that maybe whatever they have going on is just more than art. And, and, and art, especially radical art, has always been, you know, it's it's always been you got to, I, I, I was always strongly connected to art that had something to say. And and whatever is radical, look at the Beatles, look at the Rolling Stones back in those days. They were really radical. And that's how that's how um subcultures were born, and that's how subcultures were basically gentrified, because everything is gentrified right now. So our cultures, our countercultures are being gentrified right now in some capacity because we're with we, whatever we we did 20 years ago and 20 people cared now a lot more people care and now big companies are using those artists they're using that radical very radical art to sell to sell products to people to push products on people and and yet here we are you know and and there is a segment of the local music industry that is by birthright which is a very nepotistic um favoritism thing to do by birthright they they have access to a lot more funds than any other band that got something meaningful to say but whatever band has anything meaningful to say they find new ways 
and they they let go of the old ways and they're going to use their new ways to do something really cool yeah but you know i just really want and, and when i draw the line between post-sovietism and corruption i just wanted to point out that the the project i mean the, the idea of behind, behind the warehouse project it's very nice i mean it's not a warehouse project so it's uh, the warehouse shows it's it's nice to help the bands but we can say that i mean obviously i can't say and somebody will find a little little dot somewhere where i, I failed in this but i think this was mainly the help for the hungarian music scene like that was the funding that was the way to help them and the sheer amount of money was spent to to the actual production of how it's happening compared to the money what was given to the artist was in my opinion it was pretty much not acceptable or not the right way maybe reversed it would be fine and also all the all the companies and yeah as Zoli said like you know we have we have bus drivers we have the people who are doing sounds and lights and you know visuals and, and you know the roads everybody they were not being really able to participate because it was you know held down by a monolithic production setup and as we said the artists were getting paid and that's really great and they were and and i know that many artists decided to split the fee most of the fee towards their crew but it's still not the you know it's not the way because everywhere else and okay not everywhere else but most european countries there were a kind of a scheme to help uh help the cultural sector in general and i'm not talking about only artists but i'm talking about the bartenders and everybody else including the horeca sector because that's also struggling and i know all the sectors are struggling but culture was at least in my opinion it was it was a kind of a botched uh progress so far and it was under managed how the cultural sector was helped in hungary and as i i mean i know that there were funding programs but most of them were not really having the effect and you know the real effect would be and if you, if you look at how in the summer hungary was able to operate with 500 capacities let's say even in in other countries you can't let in more than 30 or 50 people to a room you know it, it it's a kind of a we are letting you do something but we are not really helping but we can't say you close i mean you, you have to you have to close your store you have to close your venue and now we reached that point i mean not now but in october we reached the point of a total lockdown and there is still no help there's still no help coming in to the cultural sector uh and and i'm talking about generally the culture so i'm not saying that only heavy metal music is culture but you know generally the pop culture is not really getting any kind of funding i can also relate to that that uh we were also invited um, to the warehouse concert uh, with my band and uh, I think we are in a very lucky position that all of us are making uh, money from something else. So obviously music is very, very important to us, but all of us have their own daily jobs. So we had the chance to actually turn it down because it felt really weird for us that mainly our music is uh, not tolerable for these people, but for some reason, we were in the lucky ones who were invited. And we just felt like that it would be such a, um, it, it wouldn't be a good message if we would take on, on that role, because, you know, from after the, the whole thing started, from time to time, there were articles coming up on um, how the whole thing is corrupt at the end of the day. And we were just so happy that we turned it turned it down because we just felt like this is really not us. And, and we were also lucky that it didn't determine our income at that point. And, and I'm just also thinking that, you know, the people who got the money at that point, I'm very sure that since life is quite expensive, it's already gone. <laughs> So like you know that was the half like like this is the end of it and and from now on what because the problem is is still present we are still under a lockdown and and there's a lot of people who who can't make money out of anything so it's a really tough situation I think 
Thank you very much. We've got time for one more question. So I would like to ask what your expectations from 2021 are and uh, uh, what do you think when we will start functioning again and um, when things will be back <laughs> in normal and how do you see your own plans uh, in the next few months or the next year? Um, you know, uh, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm working now uh, on postponing shows and, and I, to be honest, most of the artists are not expecting to play tours in 2021. So most of the things are already pushing over to 2022. Uh, difference, obviously, for the Dutch market, uh, we are expecting shows to happen, like domestic market shows could happen, like artists playing at their hometowns and stuff like that. That's pretty likely. But uh, but the touring is not really, I, at least what I see now, it's not really looking like comeback before October, like international touring. And we do that, you know, we, we are basically building a venue almost from scratch. So we need the time and it sounds really insane, but sometimes we are just, you know, you know, winking at each other that actually the, the fact that we can't open in the next, like say, I don't know, a couple of months or maybe the main main hall of the venue might take extra months over that. So way into the, into the fall or winter period, we can say that we are not really missing anything, which sounds crazy and it sounds rude, but you know, at, at, at least this is something what we are trying to just slap our own backs to say that, okay, we have time to build it and time to make it really great because we are not missing any kind of shows. Thank you. Mimi, how do you see the future in the next few few months? Um, I mean, <laughs> doing what I can. I don't know. Um, I mean, it, yeah, it's it was definitely a, 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 yeah, uh, <laughs> a challenge trying to make plans and getting motivated about the year without really knowing what the possibilities are so it's kind of like yeah not really seeing very very well you know, like in the dark but kind, kind of like seeing the light um yeah uh yeah i definitely have a couple plan a couple projects that i'm working on and really excited about um so i'm trying to stay focused and motivated uh about songwriting and those the projects that i know are not dependent on COVID, you know, you know what I mean? So that those are, those are the sectors that I'm kind of focusing on. And yeah, like the others, I'm, I'm not really trying to think much about live shows because who the hell knows what's going to happen and whether we're going to be able to stand on a stage anytime soon. So uh, like a lot of other artists, I guess, um, you know, if it happens, if we do get to stand on stage, that's amazing and great. And I cannot wait. I'd be more than happy. Can ah, uh, yeah, that would be amazing. But um, but yeah, I guess, you know, what all of this has taught me and 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 in my team is is to think of new ways, uh, you know, to expand and and how to adapt. You know, it's taught us a lot about adaptability and trying to trying to use our skill sets in, in, in more ways than one. And if anything, in my personal situation, it has been confirmation that, um, you know, expanding online and using these platforms, that using technology, using, um, you know, these assets has definitely been, been beneficial and something that I would like to rely on more in the future and see how I could use it to my advantage and, and, uh, same goes to to my team. So I guess we're just doing what we can and tr and trying to learn how to how to ha how to you know multitask in a way and and rather than having one financial source, having two or three, even if they're very minimal, but trying to to find a solution to not being in this situation again if you know, we never know what, I guess, what the future brings and what challenges we will face. But, uh, but I guess the one thing that we can do is kind of 
stay sane and uh, to <laughs> try to stay sane and to, uh, you know, hold together with those around us and see who who are the people around us that 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 we can um, that uh, that we can provide comfort for and vice versa. I guess in this situation, that's what we really have uh, for sure is like yeah just having people having people around us and yeah staying (laughs) staying staying strong i guess while while a lot of is still unclear so yeah (laughs) nice thank you thank you zoli what are your expectations and what are you looking forward to the most (laughs) i am looking forward to be out of the house but (laughs) no i'm I'm actually I'm on uh, I'm on the same page as Mate. That's probably because of the similar nature of our jobs. Um, I I do feel um, nothing is going to really start before October. I have a I'm working on two European tours, one for October, one for December. But everything else I am I have or am postponing to 2022. Um, <laughs> It is, it is what it is. I, I think it's, it is exceptionally tough times in our sector, but we, we have to stand strong and, and do what's best, you know, and do what's best for us. You know, um, I, I have made my peace long ago that most of 2021 is not going to happen. So based on that, I'm trying to plan. Um, I'm trying to talk to each and every artist that I represent and, and just craft plans for, after this is uh this pandemic's gone um and that's it i'm i'm a professional this is my skill set so this is this is the only thing i'm probably good at other things but this is the only thing i really love to be good at you know so um yay to mo- postpone tours and and i'm i'm surely hoping october is happening already if if not i am sort of made my peace but i'm looking forward to be on the road because to be on the road it's it's something amazing so i am i am i'm trying not to jinx it but if if it goes down and and the world in some capacity reopens i am on the road in november december which should be really cool and this is something that i very much look forward to other than that we just gotta adapt that's pretty much what I think everyone here shares that we need to adapt and and we need to do our best. Um, I I do think some things here and there domestically can happen. I have very little hopes that bands from overseas are going to be able to come to Europe in 2021. But let's see. I mean, none of us can really predict and, and see, you know, and pretty much everybody's waiting for a Hail Mary to come and this thing to magically disappear. It probably won't. So it's going to be a tough couple of months ahead, but you got to do what you got to do. That's true. <laughs> Sonny, what about your plans and what are you looking forward to the most? Um, I really think that I'm an artist in, in a very classical way, <laughs> meaning that uh, I do feel like that our music is not really working online we don't have uh, an opportunity to adapt in that sense because us we are working live very well and of course um, you know as zoli pointed it out you can listen to our uh, lp you can listen to spotify and and whatever but for me personally uh it's mentally challenging to not to play shows because that's an outlet for me from my own uh, life where I have my normal daytime job um, and and music for me is really something that is very like I can't put it into words what it means to me to play live shows and and I miss it so much that I'm naive and too optimistic about when and what is going to go down. And uh, as I mentioned it to you guys, um, we just got our first um, uh, email the other day that we might be able to play this summer. And I basically almost cried because I was just so happy. Like basically if they would have said that I have to pay to play, I would, (laughs) I don't care. So 
I just I'm just <laughs> I'm just looking forward to that. Thank you. And I think we should stay optimistic and naive. That's a good thing. Uh, we run out of time, unfortunately, but um, guys, I have to thank you so much for your contribution. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. I hope to see you <laughs> very soon. Thank you for watching us. And if you have any questions, please let us know, contact us. Um, take care. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for having Bye. me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.